Hello everyone, welcome to GA's live stream today. Today we are doing Understanding Game Design and Culture and we have Eric Zimmerman here. He's a game designer and founding faculty, faculty member at NYU Game Center. Thank welcome, you. Welcome Eric. Thank you Molly. Um, also I want to thank General Assembly and the Webby Awards for putting this on today. Um, let's talk about uh, games and game design. Um, I am a, I'm a designer and um, I think like a lot of people watching this, uh, watching this live stream who are also designers, I'm, I'm a particular kind of designer, I'm a game designer. And today I wanted to gear my comments not towards a super geeky shop talk just for game people, but I wanted to ask a more general question, what, what does a game designer do? And answer that question in a few different ways and also show some of the projects that I've done as a way of illustrating some of these concepts. So this today is a little bit theoretical, a little bit uh, designer talk, um, and uh, also we're happy to take questions and comments from, from you guys as we're talking. So we're going to keep this pretty informal. Um, so just to give you a little bit of background on what I've done, um, I've been a game developer for a, about 20 years, and I've worked on a range of projects on and off the computer. Um, Diner Dash was a game developed by my company Game Lab that helped invent casual games and was a big online hit. A uh, couple other projects, Leela was a, uh, a game that I did for the Xbox Connect with Curious Pictures here in New York City that looked at the intersection of play and meditation. And Figment is one of the many paper games I've done. In this case, it's actually in a book of essays and you have to cut the cards out of the book um, to play the game. I, I ran a company in New York City for about 10 years called Game Lab that I co-founded with Peter Lee. Game Lab was an independent development studio. Um, I also have an academic life. So like Molly said, I'm a professor at the NYU Game Center here in New York City. So we hold classes in game design, game production, and game scholarship. And we have an MFA program, a Master of Fine Arts program in game design, if any of you are interested. That's uh, gamecenter.nyu.edu. I also write books and publish about games and game design, Rules of Play, a textbook that I co-authored with Katie Salen. Um, I also work a little bit in the kind of games and learning space or educational space, although it's not my main thing. Um, the Institute of Play is a nonprofit I co-founded that looks at the intersection of games and learning that has created public schools one here in New York City, one in Chicago, in which the whole curriculum is based on games and play as the model for learning. Uh, GameStar Mechanic was a project of Game Lab and now the Institute of Play. It's an online site that lets kids create games. So that's a little bit about my learning side. Some of my more recent work has been collaborations with architect Natalie Pozzi. She and I have created large-scale physical games that have been at galleries and museums and festivals. Uh, at places like MoMA here in New York City, uh, Street Games Festival in Berlin called Invisible City, and other places around the world. So I'm going to be talking about one of these projects later today. Um, so let's get started. Uh, enough about me. Um, uh, and talk about what, what game designers do. Um, like I said, I'm going to try and answer this question in a few different ways uh, over the course of, of, uh, of what we're doing today. Um, one, one way of answering that question is that game designers make rules. So um, uh, what do I mean by that? Well, when you buy a board game, think about what you're buying. For example, you're getting maybe a board with some cards in it and, and dice. And what, what has the designer really done? Well, there are illustrations and you know maybe there's some writing. But in essence, what the game designer has done is create a set of rules for you. Um, and that's also what happens in video games, that game designers, or one way of looking at what game design is, is that we create rules that people um, follow. Um, and they follow the rules in order to play the game. So let's take a quick example. Um, let's take a look uh, as rules at, at this game, Tic-Tac-Toe. Now I want, I want on the live stream, I want you guys to tell me what are the rules of tic-tac-toe? So Molly, tell me some of the things that people are saying. What is, what is a rule of tic-tac-toe? Just one rule. Let's see what you guys can come up with on the live stream. Let's hear it, guys. So type in your little chat window. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're trying to find out uh, what, what three are the row. rules of this game. Three in a row. OK, so that's a winning condition. That's, that's, that's a rule. One turn at a time. One turn at a time. That's good. 
can't use the same square. Right, so one turn at a time, you place a mark in, in an empty square. Uh, uh, always pick the center. <laughs> always pick the center. Now that's interesting because that's actually a rule of strategy, right? Um, we could play the game well or poorly. This person is obviously an expert tic-tac-toe player. <laughs> um, but um, uh, but, but we, we could play poorly and still be playing the game correctly, so to speak. Any, any, other, uh, any other ideas coming from? What else do we need to know in order to play the game? One shape per space. One shape per space. What, what about, uh, well, what about where we play? Um, I know they're probably Always starting to come squares. in. Nine squares, okay. We're, I think we're almost there. Um, no one has said two players yet, but it's kind of... Two players. Two players, okay. We, we, might almost have, we might almost have everything. So we talked about um, a three by three grid, two players alternate turns, placing an X or no in an empty square, three in a row wins. Is there any other end condition, live stream people? Let younger kids win. <laughs> oh, let younger kids win, yes. That's another, that, that actually is an interesting social rule of the game, I think. Um, not necessarily part of the mathematics of the game. Uh, if no moves remain, it's a draw. That's right. And I think, I think, um, I think they more or less, less got it. So um, these are the rules of tic-tac-toe, a, a summary of them. There's a few ways that we could write them. Um, and here's the thing to think about, which is that every game of tic-tac-toe that's ever been played in the entire world, and we're talking about you know millions and millions of hours of behavior, often a lot of it by kids, has followed these rules, right? Whether you're whether whether Molly and I would play it on the chalkboard behind us, or whether you know we would scratch it as graffiti into a wall somewhere, or play play on a piece of paper, all tic tac toe has followed these rules. And in a sense, when two people sit down to play tic tac toe or chess or Starcraft or what have you, they're agreeing to follow these rules and speak in the language of tic tac toe to each other. Um, one of the things about uh, uh, game rules that's interesting is really how, how rational they are. I mean, if you look at these, you realize that they're kind of mathematics. And one of the interesting things that's interesting about games is that there, there is a mathematical substratum to, uh, to every game. That games on one level are, are math under the hood. Um, and um, that gives games a kind of analytic quality. And, and what I mean is that um, uh, you know, there's a there's a there's a sense that which game rules are really kind of super rational. They're kind of fixed and rigid. Imagine that you're playing a board game and you're moving in spaces on the board, and you get to a space and you don't know what to do there. Well, you have to resolve that ambiguity before you can move on with the game. Um, or, for example, think about you're playing baseball and you're saying this tree is second base. Well. Um, you know, if, if someone is touching the branch of the tree and trying to get out as far as they can towards third base, can they be tagged out? Well, someone thought it was the trunk. Another person thought it was the branch. Someone else thought you could touch the root of the tree. Well, you have to resolve that ambiguity in order to play the game, or else you're just going to have people arguing all the time. So what I mean to say is that um, there's something um, very fixed and rigid and rational about rules. And when you put them, put it that way, it almost sounds fascistic. I mean, who would want to play a game where you have to enter into this sort of scientific rational system? Um, on the other hand, um, what happens when we uh, um, have rules um, is that, and we enter our, enter our behavior into the space of a game, is play. And play is, in many ways, the opposite of rules. So while rules are fixed and rigid, and, and rational, play is uh, improvisational and spontaneous and creative. And that, to me, is one of the delightful things about being a game designer, this kind of weird paradox between rules and play, that game designers create structures, but those structures unfold into play. And play is so much um, the opposite of rules. Um, and um, uh, that little kernel of paradox to me is one of the things that fascinates me as a game designer. Now I think that we can see this interesting relationship between rules and play, or you could say structure and, uh, and free behavior, um, in a lot of forms of design. You know, that Molly and I today are sitting in a building, and this building was designed by an architect, and there are really structures here, right? So the, the structures were made by the architect that limit our behavior and keep us from 
from, from doing things, walls that keep us from walking anywhere we want. But those structures at the same time enable behaviors, right? So, so, the, so there's a structure of a quiet space that we have here with electricity flowing in so that we can have this soundproofed uh, a live stream that is you know, flowing through media and the internet out to you. So um, in a sense, it, we can find this relationship between rules and play or, or structure and, and freer human behavior in many forms of design. But um, the, the thing that I wanted to say is that uh, another way of thinking about what it is that game designers do is that they make play. Although make is a weird word because although designers really do create rules, it's strange to say that we directly make play. I think it's closer to say that we engender play. Game designers create spaces of possible behavior that then um, uh, result, result in, in, uh, in people being playful. So um, let me give you an example of what I mean by this. This is a project called the Metagame that I did with Local Number 12. That is an independent game uh, collaborative uh, based here in New York City that I run with Colleen Macklin and John Sharp. So the Metagame is a game in which there are two kinds of cards. This is the video game edition. So um, there are some cards that are have video games on them. They're kind of like video game trading cards. And then there are other cards that have questions on them that compare two or more cards with each other. So uh, I'll, I'll tell you, I'll show you a little bit of, of, uh, of how this works. So for example, um, uh, Adventure, the old Atari 2600 game, this is a photo illustration of, and then Farmville. Um, so which had a bigger impact on the industry, right? This seminal game uh, from, the, from the turn of the 80s, uh, for the Atari 2600, or Farmville, the game that kind of invented social games and, and exploded casual games. Are we getting any, any um, opinions online? Farmville for the win. Farmville for the win, okay, <laughs> well. Uh, uh, or for example, here's another pair, which is a better guide to life? Sid Meier's Pirates, uh, uh, I guess if you wanna uh, base your life on uh, roaming and looting, or, or, uh, or Pong. Um, which in a funny way could be seen as a philosophical statement about um, interaction between two people and a game that's less about choosing your own adventure through a branching narrative and more about kind of free improvisation. Do we have any? What are people saying online? Pong seems to be the winner here. Ah, okay. Thank you, Molly, <laughs> for your uh, your uh, up-to-date, uh, up-to-the-moment sports commentary. Couple more. Um, which should be required in school? Uh, dope Wars? Uh, that that old economic simulation that happened to be about um, buying and selling drugs, illegal drugs, but really it was about buying low and selling high, or Dance Dance Revolution, a game that actually some schools are using now to, uh, in physical education classes. Are we getting any opinions on this? Right now, it's okay. DDR is, is the overwhelming winner All right, right. now. <laughs> we may, it sounds like we have a, we have a younger audience, although Pong, Pong did win. Uh, so uh, And finally, I also want to mention that the the, the, the metagame also is, is expanding into a culture edition in which we're going to go beyond games into art, fine art, and, um, fine art and uh, music and, and literature and film. And this is not just any old toilet. This is Marcel Duchamp's work, which in many ways uh, created uh, contemporary art at the beginning of the 20th century fountain. It was a found object that he put into a museum. Um, for those of you not, not as... Uh, 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 conversant in contemporary art history uh, versus Pong. So we're getting Pong again, a different card. Are we getting any opinions here, Molly? Fountain is winning. Fountain is winning. Okay, well, maybe video games, we have a while to catch up with contemporary art. Um, but my point about play is that, um, is that the, one of the interesting things about the metagame is that if I flip back through these slides, you know, these are really just little pieces, right, that the players reshuffle and put together. So what is it that I, as a game designer, provide? You know, I provide with local number 12 some structures and cards. We actually have suggestions of ways to play this game. Some of them play a little bit more like apples to apples. Some of them are more about arguing and debating uh, with the judge deciding or other players voting on, 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 on which, which one they like better um, of the comparison. And in a sense, um, the play that happens anytime you play a game like this is um, unpredictable. And that um, just like the architect of this building never could have predicted that at some moment Molly and I would be sitting here doing a live stream talking about game design to you, you never can really fully anticipate how it is that your players are going to interact with your games. So in that sense, um, uh, that's why I, I feel like uh, um, saying that that 
that play is this kind of emergent behavior that comes out of the structures that game designers make is a good way of thinking about what it is that we do as game designers. Um, and I should also say that the interesting thing about the metagame is that it, it plays not just um, on a strategic level like tic-tac-toe, but it really plays in a cultural space, a cultural meaning. It's obviously the answers to the questions are subjective and, uh, and maybe trying to guess at, at what's the correct answer is, uh, is, uh, is much being a good social player as it is being culturally literate or being strategic. Um, let, let's move on to another idea of what it is that, that game designers do. And um, we've talked about the fact that, that, game, designers, um, that game designers enable uh, uh, play and that they, that, they, uh, that, they, that they create rules. And another way of thinking about it is, is meaning, is that what game designers do is create a context where players have a meaningful experience with each other, meaningful interaction. And I'm gonna unpack exactly what I mean by that, but, but first I wanted to play an, uh, uh, another game with, with, the, with the audience here. So, so here, here's the way that it's gonna work. I actually need, um, oh actually, you know what? I was gonna, it's a two player game, but since we're doing it live stream, we'll just, we'll just kind of, uh, we'll just sort of go with the flow. So um, um, I'm gonna try and create a game for you and um, the game is, um, uh, we may, it may take us a few tries to get it right. So we may not get it right on the first time. So I, I, ask, I ask patience of the audience. So, so get ready on, on your live stream. So let's say that step one is just to um, uh, say a word, any word. So uh, a single word, you can't repeat a word that, that somebody else said. So uh, let's go ahead and just, just, put down, just put down any word. Uh, we're getting some words, probably some dirty words. I hope these are being censored. Any, ham. Anything? Ham, okay. Lunch meat. All right. Bacon. Bacon. Serendipity. Serendipity. Okay, well, we're getting an inter interesting mix. Not yet really an interesting game yet. Um, so here's what I'm going to do. We're going to use our old friend rules, and we're going to put some restrictions on the words that people can do. It seems like people are maybe thinking about lunchtime. <laughs> so, so, so we're going to restrict what people can do. We're going to say... Um, same thing as before, and it's just going to be words that, um, I see a stream of words co co coming up your, your screen over there, Molly. Um, it's just going to be words just for things that you can eat or drink. So just beverages, foods, prepared foods, raw foods, fruit and vegetables, whatever it is. So um, let's go. And you can't, can't repeat a word that someone else said. So let's see what's coming up on the screen. Molly? Sushi, mangoes, vodka. Oh, interesting. Turkey. Up. Oh. We got two mangoes. Uh oh. All right. So, it actually this might have been less interesting than the more open-ended one, right? Um, but that's my fault because I'm the designer. I'm supplying the rules that generate the play. So let's let's um, let's put one more restriction then on what people are going to do. Let's say that um, when Molly calls out a word, right? She's going to be picking a word. Um, one of the words that comes up. We're going to keep all the other rules. We can't repeat a word. And we're also going to um, uh, use just things you could eat or drink. And when, when a word comes up, Molly is going to um, uh, call that word. And the last letter of that word has to be the first letter of the next word. So it's still things you can only eat or drink. But we're going to do this kind of leapfrog where the last, the last letter of the previous word becomes the first letter of the next word. OK? So Molly, it's up to you. You're going you're gonna to pick which, which word. Win. So go ahead. We're going to start with anything. Start with any word, food that you can eat or drink. Go ahead, Molly. That someone is typing in. Cinnamon Toast Crunch. Cinnamon Toast Crunch. That ends with an H. Okay. We're getting, are we getting H's? Ham. Hot ha dogs. Okay. You, you pick one. Which one? Ham. Okay. The Ham. So now we're on M. Milk. Milk. Meatloaf. Okay. We'll just take one, one per letter. So that's milk. So now we're on K. Okay. All right. This should be interesting. Kiwi. Kiwi. I. Ice cream. Ice cream. We're back to M. Mango. Mango. Okay. So let's, I think you guys get the idea. Now, this is probably a better game with two people in a room. But um, at the same time, I think if you were playing the game, something happened that third time around, right? That it actually became interesting and challenging to 
to type in the responses to the game. Um, and I think that other than, um, uh, you know, other than just kind of batting the names back and forth, what happened on that third time is that it was actually possible to be clever. It was possible to, you know, present a challenge for, for, for the next round of the game. And often when we think about games and what we like about games, it seems like the goal of a game is to become as, um, as powerful as possible and to, to go anywhere and be able to do anything and be anyone and have superpowers. And it seems like game designers just create fantasies for people to, you know, be able to do anything. And while games often feel like that, the truth is that game designers deal in restrictions and um, we limit what players can do. But paradoxically, when we limit them, um, play results. And um, uh, in terms of meaning and the way that game designers create meaning, what's interesting for me about this language game is that it assigns a new meaning to language. So normally we use uh, language in a sort of ordinary way, and we might say, well, I'm going to the store to buy some milk, or I want some milk in my coffee. Um, actually, I, I drink it black. It was just my excuse to get a sip of coffee. Um, but, but in this game, milk is really only valuable because it begins with an M and ends with a K, right? The way that, the way that if you're playing rock, paper, scissors, in ordinary life, having a, a fist is, you know, can have a certain kind of meaning. Uh, maybe it means I'm feeling happy, or maybe it means oh, I'm so mad I want to hit someone. But in rock, paper, scissors, rock means something very particular. It means that it can beat paper or be beaten. I'm sorry, beat scissors. I'm obviously a rock, paper, scissors novice. <laughs> um, it, can, it can beat scissors or in turn be covered by paper. So in a sense, what we're doing when we create a game is we're creating contexts for meaning. And that as players navigate through the space or the system that we've created, um, through those architectures of rules resulting in play, they are creating meaning in a sense as they're moving forward, making choices and taking actions in the game. Um, let's take a look at an example of what I mean, a digital game. So this is a game um, that I created in the late 90s with a company called Word.com, and it's a game called Sissy Fight. It's a game uh, that's a multiplayer online game about little girls in social conflict in a playground. Um, it was, in its time, a very innovative game. It was, as far as I know, the first browser-based game with real-time chat and real-time interaction. So in, it used the Shockwave plugin, uh, a multiplayer plugin. So in, in the late 90s, that was very high tech. You can see that every girl uh, has 10 self-esteem points. And the goal of the game is to have one or two girls left at the end um, and, uh, uh, and, uh, and survive with your self-esteem intact. Um, every turn, players make a choice. Um, and you don't know what everyone else is choosing, and then the choices are revealed simultaneously. So um, now here you can see two players scratching each other, which is kind of a, a, a very simple way to, to uh, try and reduce someone's self-esteem in the game. Um, a more complicated way is teasing, but teasing only works if two or more players both team up on the same girl. So that requires you to coordinate your actions and try and get people to gang up on somebody else. So this is. Uh, just to clarify, this is not a game for children. This is a game about childhood. And yes, it's meant to be kind of perverse and humorous and, and a little bit dark, but it's a lot of fun. Um, so um, in Sissy Fight, um, meaning is made as you, uh, as you traverse through the game, making friends, making enemies. And uh, every turn, the outcome of your turn itself has a kind of meaning in the sense that um, if you can get other people to tease a third player with you, then that meaning increases in the game. Um, but I also wanted to talk a little bit how meaning doesn't just happen within a game. Game designers can create meaning in a way that kind of ripples outwards from a game and, um, and becomes something, that, uh, something that, that grows beyond the boundaries of an individual game. If we take a look at Sissy Fight again, for example, um, Sissy Fight had a very strong culture of fan art and, but here's a couple interpretations, um, one with Keith Haring, another kind of minimalist abstraction of, uh, of the Sissy Fight, um, from the Sissy Fight Museum of the 20th century, uh, all made by fan art. Um, these are more, this is, this is more um, Sissy Fight fan art. In this case, there's actually a lollipop that you can lick during the game as an action, and it gives you your, your health back. So this is actually uh, Picasso 
and then uh, Manet's water lilies that were given lollipop sticks, and then Chagall uh, on the right, and they all were sort of uh, sissified versions of this. So obviously we see this phenomenon around other forms of pop culture as well, um, people writing fan fiction and making videos, but games also can be pop culture in this way. We often don't think about the ways that meaning doesn't just happen within a game, but around a game. Just want to finish with Sissy Fight with a slight plug. We're actually doing a Kickstarter this month. This is a screenshot I took this morning. So a modest little campaign to bring Sissy Fight back. We are open sourcing the game, meaning that we're not planning on making money from it, but it's been off the internet for a few years. In its day, it had a million registered players and um, the fans have been asking for us to bring it back. So we are raising money on Kickstarter to bring it back and uh, release it as open source um, uh, um, creative commons code, art, and sound, so anyone will be able to actually make their own versions of the game, and uh, you can find more information about it on Kickstarter. Um, okay, lastly I wanted to talk, uh, well not almost lastly, a um, uh, couple more ways of thinking about what game designers do. So often when we talk about game designers, we talk about them in the context of design. Um, there's, a, there's a sense in which game designers are kind of like the people that design buildings, I mentioned architects, but industrial designers, people that might design a doorknob, and it's really about solving problems for sort of good, efficient use of, uh, of someone's time, and we talk about usability and playtesting and appropriate design for an audience. But there's other ways of thinking about games, too. We can think about games more in the realm of art, because unlike a doorknob, for example, um, people don't just interact with the game to get something done, right? It's not just like a functional utilitarian piece of software or, or physical activity or social activity. People play games because they're fun, they give pleasure. Um, they might uh, give social pleasure or narrative pleasure or, or physical pleasure. Um, but games in that sense are more like art or entertainment or popular culture. And um, one of the things that game designers do is, is that we explore ideas through the games that we play, like an artist might. Um, let's cue the video. Wanted to show you a video of a project that I worked on recently. That was a video of a project called Interference, which was one of these recent large-scale game installations that I've been creating with architect Natalie Pozzi. It was commissioned by La Gaité Lyrique in Paris, and it premiered last summer. Um, it's in Dublin now, and it may be coming to Moscow and Los Angeles, actually, this fall. Um, so Interference uh, is a game that has, as you can see from this diagram, these five large-scale hanging steel walls. The, the walls are actually less than a millimeter thick, so they're very, very thin. 
and pairs of players play a strategy game in their local area of the wall. So two people will play a little game on a local area of the wall. But um, what happens is that each turn you're playing your little game against your partner. Um, you have to take a piece from some other game that's going on somewhere else from, from another part of the installation. So as you're playing, people are taking pieces out of your game. You're taking pieces out of their game. And it is somehow strategic, but also very chaotic and frustrating. And in the end, you end up having to negotiate with other people that are sort of moving pieces in and out of your game. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about how it is that game designers start to explore ideas like this and how we work. Um, so uh, uh, if you look at this next slide, you can see that, that really game designers prototype. So games never sort of emerge fully formed from the idea space of a game designer like Athena from the brow of Zeus. Um, it's more like growing a plant. You might have an initial idea that's a seed, and then you have to really um, work with the idea as it develops through playtesting and prototyping. So I'm a firm believer in this, that it's, especially if you're doing something which is weird and experimental, you just can't figure it out in advance. You have to figure out a process where you can playtest and prototype. And these three images show different ways that we playtested and prototyped interference. Um, on the left, it was a, um, or it might be on the right. I don't know if uh, things are reversed. I think it's on the left, uh, a tabletop version of the game very early with those uh, square tiles. Um, we also did a lot of testing for scale. So that's me lying down, uh, trying, to, trying to see how tall the playable section of the game should be um, so that it is you know, easy to, to manipulate and, and play with another person. In the end, we did a lot of play testing with the walls laid out on tables. So you can see that um, these uh, pieces um, were on several large tables that simulated the walls, and people stood on either side of the tables moving around the space. So, so you, you often have to be strategic about, about how it is that you want to, um, uh, uh, how it is that you can move a project forward through a process of, of playtesting and prototyping. Now, uh, I said that game designers explore ideas. What are the ideas that we explore in, in interference? Well, there's a lot. I think that a lot of the projects that I do with Natalie Pozzi, these large-scale installations, we try and break some of the rules of proper behavior. So we try and create a context where people can be inappropriate, where you are basically having to intrude into a stranger's game and, um, uh, and um, uh, creating a bit of mischief that way. Um, I also like the idea that we're exploring games in places like art museums and cultural centers where people wouldn't normally um, play games. Um, and that, that actually uh, uh, leads to, leads to the, the kind of the last part of, of uh, my presentation today, an idea of game design as literacy. So um, part of what uh, General Assembly and the Webbies wanted me to talk about was not just games in and of themselves, but, but how they connect to culture at large. Um, and the idea of the talk of understanding game design as culture. Now we've talked a little bit about how meaning in games can occur not just within games but ripple out through fan culture, but I think that there are larger and more interesting lines that we can draw between games and the world outside of games, or between games and, and the world at large. Um, and one of the ways of thinking about this is a concept that I call the ludic century. Um, what do I mean by that? Well. Um, if we think about the 20th century, um, one, of the biggest, uh, uh, one of the biggest changes to society came through technology and, and systemization. And in a lot of ways, the 20th century was a century of the information revolution. Um, now, it started before computers. It started with things like very complex bureaucracies and uh, systems for filing information, pneumatic tube networks uh, in major world capitals, again, all before computers. Um, but computers obviously accelerated this idea of having to keep track of massively complex uh, storehouses of information. And, um, and, it, and it's led to a time in which we live now um, which, in which we're really uh, immersed and entrenched in systems. And what do I mean by that? Well, um, if you think about uh, so many aspects of your life, and the way that they are um, completely mediated by networks of information and systems of information. So, um, for example, the way that the way that you work and the way that you learn, the way that you communicate, 
um, with your friends and family, the way that you flirt and socialize and romance, the way that you connect with your governments and conduct your finances, all of these kind of basic aspects of our lives are really mediated by networks of digital information like the computer and the internet um, in ways that they just weren't um, not too many decades ago. And um, what I want to ask myself is if the 20th century was the century of information, what, what's going on in the 21st century? I would like to argue that, in a sense, the 21st century has put information at play. And part of it has to do with uh, the rise of and importance of digital technology. Um, and I think that games have an interesting relationship to these systemic times in which we live. Um, what I mean is that if we are living in a time of systems, games, in a sense, are the cultural form of systems. Um, now, of course, every building is a system, every poem is a system, every song is a system, but games are interactive systems in a much more literal sense, that to play a game, you really are pushing and pulling at the inputs and outputs of the system, seeing how the system works, and exploring the system's behavior in an, as, a, as an interactive dynamic system just in order to play the game. Um, and that even though while games are ancient, games are thousands of years old, and there are you know, ancient board games from Africa and, and Europe that, and China that, um, that are a testament to the importance of games to our species, games really have a new relevance today. And I would argue that games, in a sense, are the cultural form of systems, and that they allow a certain kind of literacy. Um, if we think about the 20th century, uh, um, the moving image was really, uh, you could argue, the dominant cultural form. Now, obviously, there was theater and there was literature and music and other important forms of media and art and culture in the 20th century. But I would argue that in terms of personal narratives and uh, epic storytelling and news and journalism, the moving image, um, which was birthed in the 20th century with the invention of cinema, um, was really a, a form of culture that that dominated what the way that the way that people understood their lives, the way that people told stories to themselves and to each other, the way that governments distributed propaganda. Um, the moving image was important. Um, today, I think games are increasingly playing that role. Um, that games are becoming more and more central in culture. This is a screenshot from uh, World of Warcraft. Um, showing that the, you know, in many ways a game like World of Warcraft is not just about uh, so-called immersion into a virtual world, but because they've open sourced their client-side um, software, people make all kinds of plugins for information. Um, this is someone, I think, uh, it looks like at an auction house, uh, looking at the, the eBay-style uh, interaction that sits within uh, World of Warcraft for, for virtual goods. Um, and so um, what I want to argue is that if we are, in fact, living in a time of systems, games are the relevant cultural form of systems. Now, I talked earlier about play, and I think that it is important to be playful. Um, and remember that I'm talking not just about describing culture, but about literacy. Literacy are ways that people create and understand meaning, just like if you write a word on a piece of paper, um, and someone else can read it, well, that's a traditional form of literacy, written literacy. Um, I would argue that today, in order to be fully literate and successful in our society, um, one needs to be literate not just in terms of reading and writing and even visual literacy and technological literacy, but understand how systems work. Um, but it's not enough to just analytically understand them. We have to really play in those systems and be playful. Um, if you think about something like Wikipedia, Wikipedia for me is really a wonderful way in which information has been put at play. In the 20th century, we can think about things like the Library of Congress in the United States or an encyclopedia set, where information was really about experts giving information to um, readers or users um, or an audience. But in our century, we have something like Wikipedia, which is a much more uh, potent symbol of how people research today, how people find out information. Wikipedia is not about an isolated group of experts dispensing their knowledge. It's, it's a messy system. It's a fuzzy system. It's a system in which the lines are blurry between producers and consumers of information on Wikipedia. And in fact, even the rules by which Wikipedia governs itself and defines those roles and polices itself 
themselves undergo change and over time. So um, for me, Wikipedia is a wonderful example of what's happened to information in our century, in this ludic century. Um, and you can see some touches of this in some of the games that we looked at today. Um, the sense that these are systems in which um, players do things with them, right? They're not just systems that, um, that sit on a shelf and that players access. That's something like the metagame, for example, is really more like a deck of cards than it is like a closed game. And we see players inventing their own variations for the metagame all the time. And, and uh, sim similar things happen uh, with Sissy Fight, for example. Um, design is the third component of what I'm calling these literacies in the ludic century. Um, and it's simply the idea that um, we have to learn how to construct and um, change these systems for the better. That we're living in a world in which our problems are, are massive and systemic in nature. Um, things like global climate change and, and, and global poverty and um, uh, pan pandemics and, and complex cultural conflict. And in a sense, the kind of thinking that I think is going to solve these systemic problems that are less about the good guys and the bad guys and they're more about a very complicated set of relationships um, and how they interrelate to each other is going to come from the kinds of literacy that I'm describing here. Um, I'm not saying that games are going to save the world by any means, but what I am saying is that the kinds of thinking that we do when we play games, when we try and understand how they work and study them, and when we design them, are linked to the kinds of literacies that I see becoming essential and crucial in today's world. And I should say, at least for the American education system, those literacies in general are not being addressed. That standardized testing in our country has dragged education back to the 19th century, uh, even while the, the demands of today's time are, are really pulling it forward into, into this idea of the, the ludic century. Um, so um, maybe I'll, maybe I'll uh, wrap it up there and, uh, and just finish by saying, um, reminding us that uh, the, uh, even though I'm talking about games and the relevance to the times in which we live, I would never want to say that games are important or valuable just because they help the world or just because they educate someone. I think that games are beautiful um, in and of themselves and play is beautiful. And appreciating the aesthetics of games is, is one of our challenges as we move forward uh, in this ludic century. So just to review what we looked at, um, we talked about what it is that game designers do. And um, I, uh, I, I looked at that in, uh, in several different ways in terms of rules and play and meaning, the way game designers can explore ideas through an iterative process, and even the way that games can connect to and facilitate literacy. Um, as a final thought, just want to remind you all to be playful and thank you very much. Question? That's it. Yeah. So I think we have some time left in the stream. Let me check my clock. You do? Yeah. Maybe uh, 10 minutes or a little bit more. So I'm happy to take questions. Molly is going to uh, facilitate. OK. Start throwing out your questions, guys. Get a sip of coffee in. <laughs> Suddenly the Twitter stream has grown silent. It's a lot of thank you. Molly said that there were some funny, there were some funny exchanges going on uh, during my talk. Hopefully they weren't about me, but probably they were. OK, how did you figure out how to approach Leela? Oh, how to approach Leela. Yeah. So Leela was uh, the game that I mentioned um, uh, at the beginning. It was a project with Curious Pictures. Um, and actually, Leela, Leela was a project we also collaborated with Deepak Chopra, who you may not, may not know is, is an American um, kind of uh, spiritual uh, thinker and, and guru, and um, uh, not someone whose ideas I was too familiar with before the project, but I was really attracted to the idea of working on a game that was about play and meditation. Um, Actually, I myself study Kung Fu and uh, at the Shaolin Temple here in New York City. And I've studied uh, martial arts as a form of Buddhist meditation for many years. That was one of the reasons why I was interested in seeing if there could be some overlap with, with, uh, with Leela. So we developed for the Xbox Kinect. And um, we were developing for the Kinect before 
the Kinect actually was released to the public. Um, so I have to tell you that it's, it's a very challenging platform to create a game for. Um, for example, it's not really the kind of magical box where it understands everything you're doing at every moment. Um, it's, it, it, it has some lag and it's not completely intelligent, although it certainly is a really interesting new kind of way to interact with a computer. It's also very hard to do things like have a menu and, and select options. And I think if anyone who's ever played any Kinect games know that you feel like you're often fighting the interface as much as you are um, working with working with it to, to actually get something accomplished. Um, we iterated a lot on Leela. So the process that I talked about where you create a prototype and you try out your prototype and you base design decisions on on uh, your experience of the of the work in progress um, was something that we that we definitely um, uh, that we that we definitely took to heart with Leela. We made many prototypes um, with the Connect, um, without the Connect, and we really our our approach was to focus on aspects of the of the interaction that 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 it could do well. So we had very slow movements, very meditative movements. Our games were less about trying to simulate uh, shooting a gun or, or or using a lightsaber, and they were more about kind of slow, gradual movements that that hopefully were meditative uh, to play. So that answers that question a little bit. OK, we have lots of questions. OK, great. Uh, what's the relationship between gaming literacy and structural power? Structural power? I think that's an interesting question. So. Um, I think that the ways in which, and this is really a question for someone that studies uh, culture in, in a, as a more humanity scholar, but I'll do my best as a naive game designer. I think that in terms of how power manifests in society and culture, um, those manifestations increasingly take place through media and technology. And um, in the 20th century, the moving image was you know, used classically to, as instruments of government propaganda, for example, and Gita Bort, Society of the Spectacle, is a whole book about how images um, and the wor a world of images at that time was sort of defining people's psychology and, and social and cultural power and uh, something, that, something that he took a very critical approach to. Um, more recently, I think that you know, advertising and corporate power is also something that happens through media. So, um, the idea of being literate in media means that you don't just take things for granted, right? That you that you actually um, have a critical relationship and maybe can understand the uh, structures of power behind what it is that you're experiencing, whether what you're experiencing is an organization of people or or, or a government or a piece of media or culture. And I would say that if game game literacy or ludic century literacies means thinking like a game designer, one of the unique properties of games is that as you become an expert player in a game, you have to deconstruct the system. You have to understand how the system works. So people that are professional game players, whether they are uh, in StarCraft or uh, um, uh, Street Fighter uh, series or something like that, people that become very, or, or professional athletes, People that, that play games professionally and deeply have to really analyze and understand how their game works. Now, I would contrast that with something like film. It's possible to be a film fan, to be a, a film buff, to be a, to be a historian in film, but not know what, for example, the 180 degree rule is, right? The, the, the idea that when you're editing two characters, you have to keep the camera on the same side as the two characters that are talking. Otherwise, it's going to look like they're switching places if you're crossing over the 180 degree rule. Now, you can be um, a, a tremendous fan of a genre of film and not have any idea about that sort of uh, trick of cinematography and editing. However, if you are a tremendous fan of enjoying game media, you really end up having to deconstruct how the system works. So. How does that relate to this idea of power? Well, I would say there's an analog there that as you gain literacy and understanding and deconstructing and, and taking apart and putting together systems again, there's, it's, it's harder for uh, mechanisms of power to influence you in an uncritical way. And it also becomes easier for you to, um, to, to, um, uh, to overthrow power, question that power. Actually, a longer version of this talk has as an example of literacy um, some of the designs that were made by 
uh, members of the Arab Spring um, uh, in Egypt when they were working against the government. So I think that these ideas of gaming literacy actually do apply in political contexts as well. But again, I, know, I would never want to say that games have to help you or help the world in order to be valuable. I think that games are part of being human and it's, it's, a, it's important to enjoy play just as a joyful experience. Okay. Molly? What are some uh, of these, your... are, these are good questions, yeah, by the way. Tough questions. questions. Yeah. Uh, what are some of your favorite games that could be used in the classroom? Games used in the classroom. Okay, so I really want, want some of that. Um, that's, a really, that's a really excellent question. I mean, there's so many ways to use games in the classroom, and I, I would recommend that people look at the Quest to Learn site. That is the school here in New York City, and then there's a Chicago Quest to Learn that's being created by the Institute of Play. Um, rather than recommend specific games, because it's kind of like saying, what game would you want to play at a party? Well, what kind of party is it, right? Are, are people naked in a swimming pool or are people, you know, enjoying tea over, you know, over a coffee table? The games that you'd want to play there are totally different. Um, so um, I think that people often try and invent games specifically for the classroom. And I, I would look at good games that themselves can be context for learning rather than games that are created just for the classroom. I mean, there are some great educational games. But um, for example, people often talk about games that will help kids stay in school um, longer. And um, they often talk about doing a simulation of a high school with at-risk kids, and you're trying to keep the kids in school. And they're kind of trying to simulate the effect that they're trying to have on the school. Whereas I would say, if you want to do something with digital games to keep kids in school, start a StarCraft League. Right? There are games that keep kids in school. They are basketball, at least in America, and, or soccer, or football, you would say, um, outside of America, and, and um, team sports, chess club. These are activities that keep kids coming to school and give them a reason, and it's sort of not games providing information, but games providing a social context. So um, the, uh, Star there are StarCraft leagues at the college level, um, and teams at a lot of universities, and uh, I don't think they offer a lot of deep athletic scholarships, but it's a way to create community in your school without having to reinvent the wheel. Um, so I always look for the educational um, capabilities of, of good games that are maybe designed for entertainment. Um, chess teaches so many things about mathematics and logic, learning how to win, learning how to lose, focus, discipline. Um, Kurt Squire is a scholar that studied um, how civilization can be used as a teaching school. Constance Stenkeler, another scholar that studied um, the kinds of social learning that goes on in massively multiplayer online games. So that's kind of my answer is think about what, what games uh, could be used. If you're really interested in this topic, I'd recommend the, the Games Learning and Society conference happening in Madison, Wisconsin this summer, and also the, the Games for Change Festival happening here in New York City. Um, which explores the, the idea of social change through games. They're both wonderful, fantastic events. OK. I think we're about out of time today. So all right. thank you, everyone. Sorry we couldn't get to all the great questions. Um, thank you. Eric, do you have any final thoughts or a way for the viewers to follow up with you? Um, questions? Yeah, uh, my final thought, I'll just plug Sissy Fight again. Come find us on Kickstarter. You can follow me uh, on my blog, um, ericzimmerman.wordpress.com. There's a, a portfolio of all of my work at ericzimmerman.com that also links to my blog. So I want to really thank you. Thanks for the excellent questions. Thanks for playing uh, today over the, the, uh, the chat feed. It was a lot of fun. And thank you, Molly. You're very welcome. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you next time.